Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, singers, musicians. God bless you. God bless you for your faithfulness in giving tonight. And truly pray for God's will and direction for your life. You know, when, when I was growing up in the Lord, and uh, we used to hear a lot more of it maybe years ago, you know, we would, we would ask people, pray, ask, what does God you to do? But I think we've kind of moved away from it. We're afraid of what God might tell us to do. But aren't we supposed to be people who do the will of God? Thank you for that overwhelming amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And you know, a lot of times we're just like Moses when it comes to God speaking to us and wanting us to go on an assignment, wanting us to do something for him. We come up with excuses. I'm too old. And nobody here tonight's too old. But then we say, oh, I'm too young. Oh, I'm, I'm too busy. Oh, I don't have enough money. And we use all these excuses. But, you know, just like God did with Moses. You know, God, God just kept coming back with an answer. And then, you know what? Finally, God got mad. God said, Moses, you better smarten up before I hit you upside the head. Um, he didn't say it exactly that. You know what, Moses? Then I'm going to send Aaron then. I'm going to send Aaron. So tonight I want to just encourage you with the realization that as the church of Jesus Christ, we are on a mission. We have a mission. We have a commission. And what happens sometimes we, we lose sight of that. What I want to do in the next few moments is exhort you and challenge you to rise up in faith and to believe God that there will be some breakthroughs next week and the week after and the week after. That God will stir something fresh in your heart. I was reading um, a book. I'm going to be teaching this at the School of Ministry if anybody is interested. April 22nd. Uh, this is the history of the Assemblies of God as a, as a movement. And it's called People of the Spirit. People of the Spirit. And uh, as a, a church that is a part of the Assemblies of God, uh, we believe that we are people of the Spirit. Oh, there used to be a day in church when people would be shouting amen. And George Wood, George Wood is our general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. Uh, he dwells in uh, the Holy Land, not Israel, but uh, Missouri. Uh, that's the Mecca for the Assemblies of God. They have their headquarters, the General uh, Council headquarters in Springfield, Missouri. And he is over the Assemblies of God nationally and internationally. Um, I've heard him speak. I've met him. We had his predecessor here speak for us, Tom Trask, if you remember. He spoke here. And Well, anyway, George Wood, he is over the Assemblies of God. There are three-plus million adherence to the Assemblies of God in the United States, but worldwide, listen to this, there are 70 million adherents to the Assemblies of God. Now, the Assemblies of God is the largest Pentecostal uh, movement or denomination, however you'd like to say it, but it's, it's not the only one. We number worldwide a half a billion people worldwide. Uh, more than a half a billion, that's 500 million people who claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic. What we mean by that, they believe that what happened in the book of Acts was not just for the book of Acts, but it's the New Testament norm. It's for today. Believing in the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues believing that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. And, and one, one of the things that really was a driving force, now we're talking about the Assemblies of God just turned 100 years old in, nine, in 2014. Uh, the Assemblies of God was founded uh, as a denomination in 1914, came out of the Azusa Street Revival of 1906. Back then, there were just hundreds and even th just thousands of Pentecostals. Now there are 500 million worldwide. Now, 
what the pioneers believed. Now, they, they believed this when there was little or nothing. There's few in number. What they believed and they heavily leaned on was Hebrews 13.8. Hebrews 13.8, you know it. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. They, they, they strongly believe that. They believe that since Jesus has not changed over the centuries, they believe that we should expect the, that he operates today the same way he did in the book of Acts. And we believe that there is an apostolic faith and there are apostolic methods. But they're not just for the apostolic era or period. Not just for first century, book of Acts, first hundred years of the church. No, we believe that there is an apostolic faith. And what we mean by that is the same way they believed God back then, we could have that same kind of faith. And the way and the methods and the way that the early church functioned, we can function like that. But we moved away from that. We have to understand in the working of God, there is a divine factor and there is a human factor. Is there not? There are some people who would want to just pray and just believe God and just do nothing. Pray and believe God that he's going to do it all. But that's not the case. Then there are other people who work hard and they work and they work and they work and they don't pray. And they almost live as if it all depends on them. But that's not the way. Someone once said, you need to pray as if it all depends on God and you need to work as if it all depends on you. It's that combination. It's that both and, not either or. It's the divine and the human factor. We see that in the 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul said it this way. He says, I planted the seed. Apollos came along and he watered the seed. But you know what he went on to say? He who plants and he who waters really, I don't like the way he said this. But he said they're nothing. We are something, but he was trying to make a point. He says what really matters is God who has to give the increase. But see, why he was saying they were nothing was, was for a reason. See, that's why it's so important when you study the Bible, you understand context. The context of what comes before and after the passage of Scripture. Because if you take a Scripture, how many of you know cults take Scripture to prove their belief system? But they can be so whacked out and so off the, the beaten path. But they'll use a Scripture, the Bible says. But they're taking it out of context. Paul, the reason why he was saying he was nothing and Apollos was nothing, because the church in Corinth was starting to worship, if you will, almost, idolize Paul or Apollos, and they were saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, and they were kind of getting clicks, and they were, they were drawn to people. We're not so far from that sometimes. Are we not? Even in the church, we, we put people on a pedestal, even in, you know, uh, American Christianity, uh, Christian TV, and we kind of put people like, you know, wow, I'm, I'm of him, I'm of her. No, Paul said, listen, Peter's nothing, Paul's nothing, Apollos is nothing. It's really God who gives the increase. He was trying to get the people to get their eyes not on man, but on Jesus. He wasn't negating or minimizing the work that he or Apollos did. He was just putting the right perspective. Does that make sense? Now, what, what um, George Wood did in this, he, he wrote the foreword. This is written by Gary McGee. And again, it's the history of the Assemblies of God. Uh, and they call it the people of the spirit because it tells of how just a small group of people uh, just began an incredible movement to, 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 to the point today that the assemblies of God has uh, uh, the most, if not the, one of the, but I think it's the most powerful missionary movements around the world. When I travel overseas and I see you know, we, we kind of, unless you, you bet you're from other countries, but we kind of get used to um, the American version of Christianity. But when you go overseas and you see uh, the move of the Spirit in countries all around the world and what the Assemblies of God is doing, uh, not the Assemblies of God, but the Holy Spirit in the Assemblies of God. So, so what, what George Wood did in the foreword, he mentioned 
uh, just three characteristics that w stood out to him as, you know, in writing the foreword of this book and understanding the history and having studied it himself, he came out with, he came, um, well, he wrote about three characteristics or three traits that stood out amongst uh, these special people that God used. How many of you want to be a special person that God uses? I said, how many of you want to be someone that God works through? And these are the three traits. And I want to lead us into a few moments of prayer that we just call out to God and just pray that God works by his spirit like he has done in the past because God has not changed. Jesus has not changed. He is the same. Amen? Well, here are the characteristics. Number one, humility. Humility. We know the scriptures. James chapter 4, verse 6. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, Proverbs 3.34 says basically the same thing about God giving grace to the humble. You see, without humility, without humility, our education, our accomplishment, our egos get in God's way. You see, I think that the reason why God's spirit doesn't move as powerfully and as plentifully as he moves in other places of the earth is because of our pride. Hello? Come on, just stay with me. You got to still love me. You might not like what I'm saying, but you got And what I mean by that is, I, you know, sometimes we got the image, you know, a proud person walks around with their, you know, head up in the air and their nose up in the air and, you know, they're so arrogant and, 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 and we make a character out of a proud person. And we say, well, I'm not like that. But you know what? Pride could be very insidious, could be very subtle. And sometimes our pride is manifested by our independence from God. We're smart so we can get the job. We're strong so we can work harder. We're smart so we can do certain things. And then I believe that the greatest form of our pride is our prayerlessness. Oh, come on, just stay with me for a few more. I promise not to keep you for two more hours. But I believe that our pride, one of the forms of our pride or manifestations of our pride is prayerlessness. And you say, really? Yes, really. Because we... We, we, we can't, well, I don't have to pray because I'll just work harder. I don't have time to pray because i got so much to do. And I believe that a lot of times in our church, in our churches, in our lives, that as the people of God, you know, we have become so, so self-sufficient that, you know what, we, we only pray when it gets really bad. And on a daily basis, we might not pray regularly. But, you know, you and I need to pray every day. I can't make it without prayer. I can't make it. You can't make it. When I read the scriptures and I come across those passages that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that he, before, before it was day, early, before the sun came out, Jesus went up into a mountain to pray. Imagine, he was the Son of God. He didn't have a sinful nature still had to depend upon his heavenly father because he said, I can do nothing. As I see the father, so I do. So imagine if Jesus didn't have the struggle with, our, with, his flat, with, with, with the sinful nature like you and I. How much more do we need to pray? Aren't you sorry that when we're praying? It's so much easier to live with. Ask your spouse. You know, said when you when you don't pray a day or two, you feel it. But when you don't pray for a few weeks, feels it. And long, everyone feels it. If, amen. Isn't it to be in the spirit? You know, you just feel different. Like you feel free. You know, instead of being bound, instead of being insecure, instead. God doesn't want us to live like that. He wants us to be people of the Spirit, people free. 
So it takes a humility. Paul the Apostle was an example of one who grew in humility. You know, you know we need to grow in humility? Amen? Turn to the person next to you. Say, he might be talking to you, so listen up. Hello? <laughs> oh, my Lord. Some of you look so glad to be here tonight. Come on, you made it here. Why don't you enjoy it? Come on, you made it here. Come on, people saw you come in here. You're one of us now. Paul was an example of one who grew in humility. I, I know you're frozen. We're putting the heat on. Many are cold, few are frozen. But Paul was an example of one who grew in humility. He wrote, listen to this, he wrote in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, scholars say, was written probably 56 A.D., 56 years after Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I'm the least of the apostles. Well, you know, at least he was an apostle. But he said, I'm the least. In 60 A.D., four years later, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he said, I'm less than the least of the saints. He went from being the least of the apostles. Now he's like least of the saints. But he didn't stop there. Now in 62 or 63 AD, writing second, uh, 1 Timothy, he said, I'm the chief of sinners. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not in your Bible? I must have a, I got the new international version, the new Italian version. Imagine, that's Paul. Paul, you would think he's growing and he's getting higher and higher and mightier and he's going to be called Right Reverend Archbishop Pope Cardinal Paul. No, he's, he went from being the least of the apostles. This is, a, this is a, a, a spiritual development. He was growing in humility, but he wasn't growing up. He was growing down. So each time he mentioned it, you do, you do the research. 1 Corinthians, written maybe 56, 57 A.D. Ephesians, written 60, 61 A.D. 1 Timothy, maybe 62, 63 A.D. And each time he went from least to less than least of the saints to the chief of sinners. There was no pride with Paul. There was no arrogance. Humility. God blesses humility. And you know what? That needs to work in our relationships to one another. Amen? God help us. Amen. Can we be a little bit more humble? I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, sister. So humility, that's what George Wood saw in, in the lives of the pioneers. And another, another characteristic was hunger. Hunger. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus taught us that. And see, the early Pentecostal pioneers, they were stories about people who hungered for more. They wanted more. They were not satisfied with the status quo. God, help us. I am not stat satisfied with the status quo. I am not happy with just uh, church business as usual because I don't believe God is happy with it. Because what we think is norm is subnorm. When we go back to the norm of the New Testament, God help us. Do we still hunger after God or do we come to church and doing God a favor for being here? Pastor, I'm doing you a favor. You know, this is Wednesday night. You know, not a lot of people are here. You should be patting me on the back. Yes, I, I'm glad you're here. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But, but the early Pentecostals, they, were, they had such a passion. They hungered for God. They were not satisfied. They would hunger for God. It would lead them to prayer. And it wasn't just, you know, a few minutes at the end of a service. They were, they, were, they were prayer people who would get on their face in these nondescript, beat up storefront places. Uh, Azusa Street was a, a feeding, uh, 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 it was like a place for, for animals. And they had sawdust and they would get on their face. They didn't care about their clothes. They didn't care about what people, because they were hungry. God, give us a hunger. God, give us a hunger. God, give us a hunger that we're not satisfied with the status quo, that we hunger and thirst after revival. 
We need a revival. We need God's people to come alive. I talk to more pastors, believe me, small churches, medium-sized churches, and large churches. I talk to pastors, and you know what they tell me? They tell me they have never seen a day and an age in the church where people just, they, you know, they think they're faithful if they come to church twice a month, two or three times a month. When I first got saved, I went to church four times a week. I was a teenager. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't odd. I wasn't peculiar. I just fell in love with Jesus. And I wanted to be, I, I sought God. And you know what? People, my family arranged their birthday parties around my church schedule. Oh, they knew I wasn't coming. I loved them, but I was radical. Oh, God forbid today. I mean, I mean, we have double blessing, triple blessing, quadruple blessing, and you've got to be there for every little event. Go to this church, go to that church, and it's like we're, we're social we're Christians. Oh, this church is having an event. That's church. I can't come today. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too snowy. I mean, you're going to have Goldilocks. You know, just, just not too hot, not too cold. Oh, Lord, I got in trouble, but praise the Lord. I got in trouble for... Wherever Paul went, you know, wherever Paul went in the book of Acts, there was either a revival or a riot. <laughs> Nothing in between. God, maybe we need to have a, a riot. <laughs> Why do we need a revival? Because we need to come alive. Come on, if we're going to all be honest, we're not as passionate as we used to be. We're not as excited about the things of God as we used to be. We're not as, 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 as passionate for souls. We're not as excited about the presence of God. If we're going to be honest, Why do we need revival? Look at the decline of culture. Look at the moral climate. I got to confess, I can't watch the news anymore. I get angry. I think it's part righteous indignation and part my flesh. Like I want to like throw something at the TV when I hear the garbage and the folly of people's worldviews and their sinful expression and, and people against mor moral truth and I mean I, it just drives me crazy and I say God I don't want to stick my head in the sand but I'm tired of listening to this God you got to revive the church God you got to change things there's a moral decline that we have not seen in this country in your lifetime your parents lifetime or your grandparents there has never been what's going on in this country I can say that authoritatively we're living in a sick culture and what's the next generation going to be that grow up like this? God, help us. We need a revival because of the moral decline of culture. And we need a revival because we've lost our edge. We need a revival because God's promised it. God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Upon all flesh, I will pour on my spirit. That's God's will. Forget about what church you, you, know, you came from or, or, or tradition or culture. It's not about that. It's about what does the Bible say in the book of Acts? What was the church? What did it look like? They were on fire. They loved one another. They cared for one another. They were passionate about the lost. We need a revival because God's reputation is at stake. God's reputation is at stake. You know, Moses in the Old Testament, I, I, you've got to love Moses. You've got to appreciate him because, you know, there were times when God, God wanted to kill his people. God wanted to wipe out the Israelites. He, God told Moses, step aside, I want to destroy them. Now, if you were Moses... Or if I were Moses, I might have said, God, I've been waiting for this day. <laughs> no, don't look at me like that and say, Pastor, you shouldn't be saying that because you probably would have done the same thing. It was so crazy. They, drove, they kept Moses out of the promised land because they troubled him so much. But you know what Moses said? Moses said, God, please, you know, if you want to do anything, blot my name out of the book. Don't. Don't kill your people, he says, because, you know what? Then the nations will say, you didn't have power to bring them in. You brought them out of Egypt, but you didn't have the might and the power 
to bring them into the promised land. When you look at the church, when you, when you look at what's going on in Christianity, God's reputation is at stake. You know, God said, and I think it was in Isaiah or Ezekiel, he said, for my own name's sake, I'm going to do this. For my own, not because you deserve it, not because I deserve it. He says, because my own glory, my own namesake is at stake. God, send revival for your own namesake. Someone once said, God, uh, revival is God getting sick and tired of us misrepresenting him. That he comes down and represents himself. And that's what we need, amen? We need, we need to show off God. By, by that passion, by that hunger, and having a hunger to return to, to that New Testament norm of what the Bible says. I want to ask you something. You know, we're, we're supposed to be, and I don't necessarily like to use these terms and, and differentiate, but for all intents and purposes, we're charismatic. We believe that what happened is the norm for the church, that there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit. There's an infilling with the gifts of the Spirit, with, the speaking, with speaking with other tongues. Do you know, statistically, within the Assemblies of God, which is a Pentecostal denomination, and this probably holds true, and probably this is a higher statistic than in other Pentecostal denominations, but I read somewhere that only something like one in four or one in three are filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, they're Pentecostals in name only. In name only. They have a sign on their church. They go to a Pentecostal church, but they don't have the experience. Does that make sense? Are you getting that? That's, that's sad. That's, that's a sobering, sobering reality. I want to challenge you. Something I've been doing personally, and I'm trying to do it more consistently, is to pray in the Spirit. I know that sounds far out nowadays, but, but let me just give you a couple of scriptures, just a couple of scriptures. If you want to turn there, 1 first, first Corinthians chapter uh, 14. I don't know what, what people who are non-Pentecostals do with whole portions of scripture. <laughs> just tear them out of the Bible. You know, they're a non-Pentecostal, and, and I'm not trying to say us versus them. We're all part of the body of Christ, but don't deny what the word of God says. I'm sorry. The Bible is the Bible. And you've got to rip out pages of 1 Corinthians that speak of the gifts of the Spirit. Let's just tear it out. God forbid. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4. Paul says this. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. What does it mean to edify? Build up. Establish. He who prays in a tongue, speaks in a tongue, edifies himself. Okay, go to um, verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. What is the result then? What should I do basically? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding. So what is Paul saying? When you pray in the Spirit, your mind is unfruitful. You don't know what you're saying, but your spirit is, is talking to God. Now, that's powerful. Paul is saying, when you, pray in a, when you pray in a tongue, you speak in a tongue, you're building up yourself. My wife was telling me this a few weeks ago. She said, you know what I want to start doing on our way to work is just pray in tongues. Think about that. Can we, can we just make a commitment? Just five minutes a day. Just pray in the Spirit. You know what's so awesome nowadays when you're in your car, right? You've got Bluetooth. You know, you've got hands-free. So you could be speaking in tongues and people don't have a clue. Not that we care, but you don't want to necessarily look like a weirdo. But now you could be speaking in tongues and people just, you're just talking on the phone. Talking on the phone. 777, call them up. Jesus on the hotline. Can we, can we do that? 
Can we become people of the Spirit again? People who just pray, build ourselves up. It's like, it's, like, it's like you would never think of allowing this beautiful little gadget to ever run out of energy. Oh, God. Nomophobia. Nomophobia is the term. God, have mercy how this thing is tethered to us. How we are so, so. You know the funniest thing? Now, let me just get off track a little bit. You know the funniest thing? Some people, I text some people, they respond to me in a millisecond. It's amazing. Don't you have some people like that? You know, no, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, it is what it is. I'm pretty quick like that to get back to people. But isn't it funny when you want to ask them for something? <laughs> or you need something and it goes dead. <laughs> These same people that get to you so quickly. I laugh with my wife. I say, you know what? You got you to gotta trick some people. You got to ask them or do something that they want, and they'll get right back. Then when you get, oh, I just gave you my trick. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Anyway, that had nothing to do with my message, but, but what I'm trying to say is, what do we do? We, we charge this, right, every day because it goes low. Praying in the Spirit is charging our spiritual battery. We're edifying ourselves. Let me ask you. This ain't a bad thing, so I don't feel like I'm putting anybody on the spot. Who in the spirit in the last week? Just raise your hand. This ain't a popularity. You're not impressing anybody. It's just, just the reality. Good. Praise God. But see, I want to encourage the rest of you. Those of you who raise your hand, don't think you're s more spiritual than anybody else. Remember what I said about humility. But the reality of it is we have at our disposal something so powerful. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me just close. One last thing. We said, we said humility. We said hunger. And then what George Wood identified was it heart. The pioneer Pentecostals, pioneer missionaries, they loved people. They loved people. You know what? God help us because that's, there's nothing greater than love. And I remember hearing someone once say, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 is the chapter on love. And I heard, I heard a, a, a preacher once say, if there's any page in your Bible that should be tear stained, it should be that chapter. And what he meant by that was we should be in, in our lack of love or humble because of our lack of love. The shortest verse of the Bible, John chapter 11, verse 35, what is it? Jesus wept. That, that occurrence of raising Lazarus from the dead was towards the end of Jesus' ministry. So that's after about three years of ministry. And you know what it shows about the Savior? Is that Jesus never became calloused with the needs of people. He never became callous. And some people were mean and ugly to Jesus. But he never did ministry mechanically, but he felt the need of people. God, help us. God, help us. You know, we, we hear about so many people, like whether it's terrorist attacks, whether it's national calamities, people dying, and, and we find ourselves saying, oh, it was just a few people. You know, my wife mentioned to me today about what happened in the UK, the, the, whether, I don't know if they confirmed there was a terrorist attack or whatever, but uh, three or four people died, and it was like, only God help us could be desensitized and become calloused. And I think that's part of our human nature, and that's part of our sinful nature that we've got to work against. We've got to grow and mature and develop in love. Jesus, he never became calloused. 
The Bible says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. I once heard a preacher say, it was uh, Mike Murdoch, you know, he's the one who does a lot of teaching on wisdom. And he said this to me, uh, not to me, I heard it in a teaching, and it really struck me because it's so true. He says, I don't know what the teaching was. He says, people are more concerned about their headache than they are about their That's convicting. Because I think in a lot of ways that's true. We hear of some, some tragedy and the next thing we're worrying about, oh, I got to get home. I got to do this at home. Instead of stopping and feeling for a moment, God help us to feel. Hello? To have a heart. When Jesus saw the spiritually lost, the outcast, the, the least, he never turned away from them. Do you know in, 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 the, in the founding or the, the beginning of missions works, there were people who went to countries and, 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 and there were no guarantee of money, no guarantee of support, no guarantee of anything. And they ministered to the orphans, they ministered to the lepers, they ministered to the cripple. And it was just, just a heart. They had a heart for people. Can we pray tonight and say, Lord, do it in my heart. Help me to love people. Help me to really feel. You hear of somebody in our church that loses a loved one. I know you've got problems. We all do. But please, find. say, God, moisten my, in my eyes. Help me to cry again. Help me to, you know, I, I went a few weeks ago to pray for, for someone um, who's dying in, 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 in hospice. And, and they're, they're, they're actually uh, homosexual. They're married to a man. And uh, the man is actually a, a local celebrity on, the, on, on TV. And, you know, I went in that hospital room, and it wasn't about gay. It wasn't about any of that. It was about a person dying without Jesus. And when I prayed for them, my, vo my voice, I, I choked up, and I said, God, I want to be compassionate, but I don't want to stop bawling like a baby either. i got to pray. <laughs> but I said, God, I want to be compassionate. I want to feel. I walk in a room. It don't, it's not about black, yellow, red, or white. It's not about gay or homosexual, heterosexual. It's not about that. It's about souls. It's about a person made in the image of God that Jesus died for. And, and I want my heart to be moved with compassion. I don't want to be doing ministry and just doing it perfunctionary. Just going through the motions, not caring for people, just doing it as, you know, and now I've been hurt and, you know, I, I, want, I, don't, I want to protect my heart. And, you know, but really love, when you love somebody, you become vulnerable. But I think we're living in a culture now. We love from a distance. We love through Facebook. We love through social media. We love from a distance. But, but to really love, you've got to be vulnerable. To really love, you've got you to get involved in people's lives. And I feel in our church, we need to get involved in people's lives. We need to love one another. We need to stop using the excuse, it's the pastor's job. Oh, it's getting quiet. I, I sense conviction coming on the place. Amen. Now, we we got to love one another. Can we pray and say, God, I don't just want to be moved. I want to be changed. God, I want to I wanna see a, a work done for you, God, in my life and in this church. You're responsible for this church. Not just the pastor, not just a few select people. We are the church. It's not a denomination. It's not a building. It's the people. You're responsible to love others, you're responsible to pray for others, you're responsible to win people to Jesus. You're responsible, you know, not to get so locked up and, and tangled up in your own life. We all have that. We all, I fight with that. Let's stand together. Did this help anybody? Come on, I'm not looking to put another burden on anybody. I'm just looking to deliver the burden of the Lord and to challenge you to have a heart to have a hunger, and to have a humility. What can God do? What can God do if the church became the church? If we got on fire, if we were revived, if we were filled with the Holy Spirit and emptied of ourselves, what could God do? I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you this week to begin to pray 
and say, God, I don't want to just get a touch next Wednesday night or Sunday morning. I don't want to just feel good. God, I want to change. God, I want to hunger for you. I want to have a heart. I want to have you. I want to be your child. Can we pray? Let's just take a few moments. Just let's close in prayer. Would you lift your voice to God? Would you just take a moment to interact with what we just shared? Something. God had to touch your heart. God had to speak to you about something. Something tonight. Come on, even if it's just praying in the spirit, would you take five minutes before we, we dismiss, before we, we leave here?